Welcome in folks, got an action-packed video here today, a lot of things to react to. A member of my private stock group asked a really good question in regards to Nike versus competitors. Nike's a stock I've been buying very aggressively the last couple months, like like pretty much every single week for the last couple months I've been buying this stock. And uh, so I wanna address that question from a private group member there. Then I wanna react to this video here, talking about we are inching towards stagflation. Okay, very important video to react to there. Then we'll go a little more on the economy. Economy has hit a stall speed, okay, and could weaken even further from here. I'm looking forward to reacting to that one. Then I want to react to this one here. Investors likely taking profit when coming when it comes to A to I, and we'll speak about you know when it makes sense to take profit, when it doesn't, right? We're gonna to listen to Nvidia CEO speaking here very recently. I'm looking forward to that one. And then the last one up here I want to react to is Salesforce and kind of many of these software related stocks. Are these stocks dead money? So definitely looking forward to getting to that one. It's an action-packed video. Busy one here today, folks. Appreciate y'all joining me as always. All ask in return. Take three seconds out of your day. Hit a like on this video, that thumbs up button, and then make sure you subscribe. That's it, okay? If you're looking to apply to a private group, get access to all the best course curriculums I have, teaching you everything that I got up here, plus access to the Discord chat where we're always talking, debating, uh, talking stock stuff. Then you can do that. That will be the pinned comment down there. You fill out an application, okay? So uh, BK from the private group says, had a realization last night, uh, mentions there are competitors that have come and gone, Under Armour, Reebok, Puma, et cetera, right? Uh, but what I realized is that all of these competitors compete with Nike by creating, to be honest, bad shoes with overseas manufacturing and attempting to make them look cool as opposed to quality. Hoka, Brooks, On, and some others are sidestepping Nike and saying we are going to compete in quality, right? So, okay. So first, there's a, there's a few different things here, right? The first is, I mean, if you know me, you know I'm a very proud American, and I think that we can do so many things so amazing in America, right? But with that being said, we're not the best at everything. If I wanted to have the best Mexican food, um, I probably wouldn't have somebody in America make me Mexican food, right? I'd much rather go down to Mexico and get my Mexican food there, right? So when it comes to making shoes, who's better? Is it United States or is it, let's say, China, for instance, right? Well, if I had to say who wants to make my shoes, I would probably trust, um, you know, the, the experts in China at actually manufacturing a shoe versus, you know, an American making $15, $20 an hour, just to be quite frank, right? And so I don't always think, although once again, I'm a very proud American, I don't think we're necessarily the best at everything, right? Uh, you know, could we in America make the iPhone as good as it is, or is it better manufactured in China, right? I don't know. Like, like maybe we can make it better. I'm not so convinced we can make it any better if it was manufactured in America, right? It might be worse. <laughs> it might be worse. Like, literally, the, the iPhone might be manufactured worse if it was made in the United States of America versus being, versus being made in, in China, right? So I think that's something to take into account there. And then when it comes to using labor, let's say outside the United States, the main reason is it brings down cost immensely, which if you need to scale, your price points have to be somewhat realistic and your margins have to be realistic, right? If you can't have sale prices, right, that the masses can afford, then you can't really do volume, right? And if you can't do volume and you can't do margin, then you can't invest into your brand, and if you can't invest in your brand, then your brand can't stay relevant year after year, decade after decade, generation after generation, like Nike can, right? So that's my opinion on this subject overall. I've worn Nike my entire life, basically, and I have nothing but good things to say about Nike as a product. I've worn them for football cleats, uh, track spikes, running shoes, always love Nike. And I'm not saying they're better than Hoka or on, like everybody's got their own different opinion, right? You know, at the end of the day, uh, I've experienced Nike for, you know, 30 years plus and always love the product. So just a little food for thought in regards to that. Let's get into these videos now. Selling Salesforce, um, because the stock is down a, a lot today. It's the worst day since July 04. Brenda, it's good to have you on the show today. Before we get to the committee member who's actually, as I said, pulling oh. the plug here. Uh, I, we're going to start down here. We're going to start here, and then we'll go to stocks. I'll just kick it off with you, because start I know you've been first. a little bit more biased towards a hike lately. Do you still feel that way after today's report, today's data? Good to be with you, Kelly. And as you just explained, the inflation figures are still very elevated. 
And keep in mind that we have had high interest rates for almost a year. We have not, the Fed has not cut interest rates in about a year's time. And still, the economy continues to be very strong. The wages are going to be are strong. And despite the slight slowdown in the first quarter GDP number, this is still a relatively strong economy. So what that says to you is that interest rate increases have not done the job yet. Or if you want to go into the uh, the geek expression of the Federal Reserve, the... Hold on. Uh, so uh, first off, can I disagree with these? L let me put myself on the spot here. No reason for a rate cut. Fed funds rate below neutral rate. Economy and inflation not slowing down. Fed should keep a rate hike on the table. So do I agree with this first one? No reason for a rate cut. The answer is, as of right now, yes. Yes, you haven't seen enough devastation in the economy yet, and inflation's still too high. So I, I do agree with that for now. That could change three months from now, six months from now, nine months from now, though, right? Fed funds rate below neutral rate. Disagree. I believe um, Fed funds rate is elevated right now, and I do believe, and I kind of look at it from a perspective of what's Fed fund rate, we can call it like 5.5, right? And where's inflation, we can call it around 3.5, maybe slightly under 3.5, right? When it comes to CPI, that to me is, uh, you know, if anything, restrictive. Economy and inflation not slowing down. I disagree with that. I believe the economy is slowing down. Uh, I just look at all these companies' earnings. Like, there's no way of. Into the there's a difference between your opinion and what's going on in reality. UPS, FedEx numbers, you know, revenues going down literally versus last year. Starbucks revenues going negative. You've seen too many companies' revenues going negative right now. To not say the economy is slowing down, it's slowing down. Fed should keep a rate hike on the table. Disagree. I don't think the Fed's raising rates. I think that's, you know, that's silliness, okay? The, the big thing is, are they just going to keep rates in a more elevated place for a longer period of time? The geek expression of the Federal Reserve, the R star or the natural rate of interest, which neither stimulates nor cuts back on the economy, is still much higher than where we are today. Even wow. the 5.5% federal funds rate doesn't cut it. And you need something even higher than that so that you can have a restraining influence on the economy. And that's what the inflation number, the GDP number, and the consumption spending number is telling you. You're not worried we're on the precipice of a slowdown. I noticed that uh, over economists over at City, which have been more uh, tempered in their gains uh, expectations of the employment report think we might only add in the range of 140,000 jobs. You know, we're starting to get down into, you know, uncomfortably low territory. Could the slowdown be just around the corner and, and help solve some of the inflation problem? Uh, the slowdown may be around the corner, but I'm not sure that is going to solve the inflation problem, Kelly, because you still have a lot of liquidity in the market. Fiscal spending has increased substantially, as even Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has acknowledged this week. They are going to keep the pressure on prices. So they are not, you're not going to have prices come down significantly, even if you have a weakening of the economy. So the Fed is not going to get a break. I know, Jay, that you're also a, a little bit worried about inflation. Where are you guys on what we might see in the employment report next Friday? I mean, it, are we are we going to have this? And I know that, Michael, this is Michael's kind of base case here. Are we going to have this stagflationary kind of scenario to start talking more about? So, Kelly, our expectation for the employment report is we're looking for about 195,000 jobs. So that's a little bit of a bounce back from what we've seen, what we saw in in April. But you know, keep in mind these numbers can be pretty choppy on a on a month by month sort of basis. And so, sure. what you really want to look at is kind of you know the three month moving average. And we think that's continuing. That's going to continue to come down. And you know, if you continue to see what we saw in the other part of this report today, that is spending actually real spending actually decline in the month of April. We're starting to see signs of stress in terms of the consumer. If we can continue to see that going forward, then those employment numbers are going to continue to come down. The, the economy probably will continue to soften up, and that should put some wage pressures bringing them down to help bring the overall inflation rate down as well. But until that happens, are you biased? I, I think if I'm not mistaken, you've said we need more progress on inflation before rate cuts are in place. So even as you're describing it, a uh, potential slowdown. I'm not hearing you say that's why the Fed needs to get ahead of this and start, you know, loosening policy. 
No, Kelly, I don't, I don't think we're quite there yet. And if you, you know, read the, the rhetoric coming out of the Fed, I mean, they want to see a, a number of months of this. I mean, the point two today in terms of the core PCE, the month on month change, that certainly is welcome. But that's the first point two we've had in a number of months now. We need to see more of that. And so are we looking for the Fed to cut rates, you know, in the near term? No. I still think September is potentially on the table here. This today didn't rule that out. But again, I think you need to see a number of months of point two and, you know, soft, softness in terms of... Cons- okay, okay. So let me kill down a false belief. I hear all the time from the CNBC folks and these other folks, they're like, oh, the Fed wouldn't be willing to cut in September because the, because the election. Are you kidding me? Are you joking? Are you... Ki- what? No, okay. If the Fed feels they're going to cut, they're going to cut in September. That's the bottom line with that. If they want to cut, they will cut. They won't say, eh, I don't know the presidential election. Because, dude, it makes no difference. It literally makes no difference. Anybody that's going to argue that B-man or T-man is going to win based upon if the Fed cuts rates by 25 basis points in September or not, they got a lot to learn about politics, about voting, about a lot of things. Because that won't even impact voting 0.01%. If the Fed lowers interest rates by 0.25 in September, do you think somebody is like, oh, now I'm going to vote for B-Man. Oh, now I'm going to vote for T-Man. Like, that completely changes my mind. What? No. People aren't even going to know that changed. And is that going to change anything in the economy? No. That's not the way it works. It takes way longer for things to impact things. And 0.25 is not going to impact anything anyways. So anybody trying to make this case about... Oh, uh, the Fed can't lower in September because it's too close to the election. I'm just like, they have no clue what they're talking about. I'm like, it's, and it's startling to me because of how many folks on like, you know, these Wall Streeters, how many of them bring that up? And it's just like, as soon as I hear that, I'm like, <laughs> you have no clue. Like, there's nothing to do with the elections or if people get voted in or now. Crazy. For the Fed Crazy. to actually then start to cut rates. Michael, I always feel like the stagflation we might get might might be, you know, a, a point in time, but not necessarily. So in other words, the economy starts slowing, but we know it's going to take a while to really feed through to inflation. Think about something like car insurance or home insurance. How, how much does the economy have to slow for how long? 18 months before that really starts to change the way that those rates might move around, you know? So I don't think we can all expect the moment that we start seeing, you know, slower payroll growth that we're also going to start seeing slack on the inflationary side. And that's unless that's your expectation. Well, I think that's exactly what we're, what you're describing is exactly what we're seeing, Kelly. This has been the most telegraphed and long period of time leading to a recession, a recession. If we even get one, we're not even sure about that. But it is, you know, that's why I say inching towards stagflation. Um, you know, we're sort of getting there slowly. We've had growth, but it's declining. Job growth was strong. It's getting weaker. The composition of jobs is more geared towards services and government versus industrial strength and, and, you know, animal spirits type job growth. Um, You've got higher for longer interest rates. You've got sticky inflation. You've got consumer data getting a little bit more um, nervous in terms of credit card defaults, auto payment defaults, et cetera. And you have corporate earnings that basically were pretty good for Q1, but the outlooks (laughs) were a lot more cloudy in terms of what companies are saying going forward. And look at something like Salesforce a couple of days ago. I mean, is that a harbinger of things to come? It's a distinct possibility. And so you do have to worry about that economic slowdown. And the inflation is sticky because we've had a lot of stimulus. It hasn't worked its way through the system yet. At the same time, you've got slowing growth and voila, that's where you get stagflation. You worried about market breadth? I'm seeing more and more notes about this. I think Bespoke had one yesterday. Um, Our guest spoke about it, David Harden yesterday as well, that we're not seeing as many stocks kind of broadly experiencing the same gains in, in performance that we've seen, for instance, the MAG7 experience. Um, I, I think the market's trying, and you're, one of the previous guests mentioned some broadening out on one of the data points. So, yes, there has, it's been broader than it has been at other points in the last year. But, no, it is still very, very concentrated, and, uh, and I think that is also a, a sort of equity risk, if you will. All right, let's get on to the next one here. Economy has hit stall speed. On bonds, tactically positive on energy. Uh, Rosenberg Research founder and President David Rosenberg joins us. Happy Friday, David. Good to see you. 
You too. Thanks for having we, me on. We were just mentioning the real consumption numbers. The Chicago PMI number is a little ugly. It sounds like data that uh, you would certainly would get your attention. Yeah, I was actually uh, enjoying uh, watching the conversation for the past few minutes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think that the economy is uh, has hit what we used to call stall speed. Uh, 1.3 percent first quarter. It looks like we're going to come close to that again in the second quarter. I find a lot of people are still focused on last year's uh, 3% plus GDP reading, and everybody thinks the economy is just uh, still coming up smelling like roses, but uh, it is slowing down materially, and now we're down to just over 1% growth. And then the question we have to ask ourselves is, uh, where do we go from here? Uh, are we going to stay at 1%? Uh, are we going to decelerate further? Because if we do, then you're going to be talking about the recession that nobody sees actually coming. And I think the other question we have to ask is that if you're if you have a bullish macro view, what is the catalyst uh, that's going to cause the reacceleration, especially now that the biggest support for the economy the past few years, which was these uh, excess pandemic savings, uh, have already been more than spent uh, as per the San Fran Fed. So uh, I, I think that uh, the economy is uh, it is weak and, and, and the risk is that it's going to weaken even further from here. Do you think next week's jobs number is going to ratify that view? Well, it's, it's really hard to say with the non-farm payroll report because uh, it's been skewed uh, so much by, you know, the, the birth death model. Uh, even though we have uh, business insolvencies going up and uh, gross business creation going down, you know, half the gains in the non-farm payrolls has come from the birth death model. Uh, so it's tough to say, uh, you know, the household survey, you know, has diverged uh, and uh, it already peaked uh, several months ago. Um, but my sense is that it's uh, it's probably not going to print negative, but I, I think that for the second month in a row, it's going to be fairly soft. I think, you know, the, clearly the economy is slowing a little, David, but I'm not sure that many would agree that it's stall speed. How, what, what, what do you see? It's still above trend, aren't we? Well, no, it's, it's not above trend. I mean, the, the growth in the economy on a supply side is not 1%, Sarah. I get, when we talk about trend, we're talking about the non-inflationary growth potential and you're really looking at uh, the supply side when you talk about trend and that means productivity and labor force growth and right now when you talk about trend it's probably close to three percent on the supply side and the demand side which is what gdp is is now running barely above one percent uh and that's why you can get a situation where maybe we don't get an nber defined recession um, but demand growth stays so far below what you call trend, which is really aggregate supply, uh, that inflation is going to come down. I think come down a lot more in the next uh, 6, 12, 24 months than what's priced in right now. And I think it's going to surprise a lot of people on the Fed as well. Finally, David, really yeah, quick. I mean, OK, let me let me finish here. Um, we mentioned bonds. Where Where is a medium term target on the 10 year for you? Uh, Define medium term. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, I think we will finish this cycle with the 10 year note um, at or below 3%. Interesting. Okay, so here's the bottom line for me. Okay, listen, if UPS and FedEx revenues are going negative, you, you can't say we're in a good economy, a strong economy. Like we're in a clearly a, a weakened economy right now, right? Doesn't mean it can't get worse, it could weaken more. But when I look at a UPS and I see their revenues down 5% plus year over year, when I look at FedEx, I see their revenues down negative year over year. I can't say we're in a good economy. Those companies should have their revenues going up basically every single year. They are the economy, right? When I see those companies reporting negative revenues, no, no, no. Okay. Um, so that's a little food for thought. Now, what could get things better? What could help out the economy? I can tell you what could help out the economy. Uh, what could help out the economy would be real wages getting a lot better. Real wages are down significantly in the past three plus years. If we could get real wages to start ticking up significantly, so meaning essentially the money you're making from your job or your business or whatever versus w what's going on in, with CPI, the inflation numbers, then we're talking, right? That could help us out immensely. So hopefully we get to that place. It's just people are still getting sliced and diced by inflation. Right now, it's just it seems like it's thing after thing after thing. Right now it's insurance. Insurance has been hitting a lot of people really hard. A lot of people's insurance rates have gone up 15, 20 plus percent in the past year, if not more than that. I'm talking car insurance. I'm talking homeowners insurance, right? And the other thing that's definitely weighing on folks big time is interest rates. So if we could talk about interest rates coming down, right? 
that could help out the economy. And then if we could also simultaneously talk about real wages going up, that could help out the economy. And that's how you get into a more bullish economy and feeling better about things. The question is, when does that happen, right? And it might still, it might not be this year. We could be looking at real wages that aren't in a good place this year. We could be looking at interest rates that are high this entire year, right? It's looking more probable than not. And so then the hope is maybe 2025, we get into a little better equilibrium when it comes to those sorts of things. So a little food for thought in regards to that one. All right, let's get into this one. Profit take it on stocks. This should be a it good one. Taking a breather as we head into June and July. Let's take it to the panel. With us tonight, Clio Capital Managing Director Sarah Kunst and Charles Schwab <laughs> Senior Investment Strategist Kevin Gordon. It's great to have both of you tonight on Last Call. Kevin, let me begin with you. Is is tech right now and the tech trade all really AI? Um, well, it's, it's interesting. It depends on who you ask. Over the past couple of months, utilities might have become something of an AI play, more from that power generation perspective. But I think for the most part, yeah, if you were going to take this back and kind of backdate it to the beginning of 23, when we really started to see you know, this AI craze get up and running, tech has kind of been the poster child in there too. But I think from a sector standpoint, there have been other sectors that have been wrapped into it communication services, to some extent consumer discretionary, but for the most part, I think software, hardware, semiconductors, it's, it's mostly tech. Are we seeing an AI breather? Yeah, I think that when you consider the fact that a lot of these names, whether they're in the tech sector or not, when they start to get up and see this much momentum to the upside, it could be a really powerful tool. And, you know, momentum is a factor or a concept. It doesn't really discriminate based on sector. It can go and live sort of anywhere. You can make the argument that that happened with utilities, um, you know, over the past month or two. But I think that once you start to see sort of a breakdown in that momentum, a reversal to the other side, which is what you've seen in some of the names that you were sort of citing at the beginning of the show, um, that that's when you start to see pretty aggressive moves to the downside. You start to take some chips off the table, maybe for some high flyers, if investors are a little bit more trading oriented, they probably start to take some profits. There. Sarah, let's dive in. We, we got the report from Dell saying that it was near zero margins on its sale of AI servers. What does that tell you about the broader space and the ability to turn a profit when what, we may be at the, you know, sort of the very beginning innings of AI? Yeah, you know, I, I think it shows that that it's not that one company is going to have an absolute moat here, right? NVIDIA isn't the only chip designer. Taiwan Semiconductor isn't the only fabricator. Dell isn't the only AI server farm. And so I think if AI is the new internet, that means there are going to be a lot of winners in betting too much on one particular horse to have all the margin just isn't going to work as well as it did last year. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I think we want this space to mature and to have real revenues in a real market and not just be one company. When you're looking at where- Okay, important everybody understands when it comes up to this subject of taking profits, right? Think about the time of year we're in now, right? We're going into summertime. It's now June. I'm recording this video in June, right? Uh, June, July, August, they can definitely be profit-taking months. We know a lot of times in the summertime, it's a tougher market in terms of getting gains out there, right? If you do well in the summertime, you're really, really doing well because if you just look at historical patterns in the market, a lot of times the summer is choppy, it's tough, a lot of down months in summertime, many years. And so we could be looking at that as well this year, right? And so just summertime is just an easy time for people to say, let me take some profits. And you know, if you as a, somebody that's always a buyer and thinking long term, it's a great time to be a buyer. It's actually arguably the best time to be a buyer in the market is during summertime when everybody's kind of like, you know, worrying about taking profits and selling and all these things. We're looking at Taiwan Semi right now or, or NVIDIA. When you see these days of uh, closing in the red, is that enough to, to tell you to urge clients to jump in? If they've got money sitting on the sidelines right now, is are these little dips the moments that you want to go in and invest in AI and especially the big players in AI like NVIDIA? I mean, one day does not a plot graph make. I think you have to zoom out a little bit right into the six month, the one year, even beyond that. But the reality is, if you love the fundamentals of this space, then when you do see sort of some air coming out of these prices, it's not a bad idea to jump in. But if you're just sort of trying to play the odds, then it's probably a better time to lock in any gains you have because you're not going to see likely another year like the ones that NVIDIA has had recently. We mentioned Vistra, but there may be listen listen 
It depends on your time horizon, right? If you're trying to trade the market and you're you're thinking about, okay, maybe jump in, grab some NVIDIA shares and try to get out next week, next month. Oh boy, okay, you're t- taking a little more of a gambling mentality in the market. If you've got a viewpoint that NVIDIA is going to be a $10 trillion company someday for XYZ reason, then you can come, you know, jump in and, and grab some shares, right? If you are thinking about, I'm going to buy some NVIDIA stock and you don't understand what's going on with the fundamentals, you're a gambler. You've got to understand there's a big difference. You better, if you're going to buy NVIDIA stock, you better understand what's going on with them, the pricing they're selling these chips for, how much demand is, is out there, right? The capex of their big customers, what's going on on a worldwide global scale, right? How is China getting these chips through other avenues? You've got to, you've got to take all these things into account, right? I'm an NVIDIA shareholder. I have all these things kind of figured out, right? I understand what's going on in the Middle East. and understand how China can access certain things, right? And so you've got to understand all these different things. If you don't, and you're just like, like I hate her approach there about like, well, you're telling clients just to jump in. I just think that's such a bad mentality because it's just like people gambling money and they're not even really thinking about the long term here, right? And then they jump into NVIDIA and imagine NVIDIA goes from, you know, 1100 to 500, you know, well, obviously the stock split's coming, but let's say the stock split wasn't going to come. And, uh, you know, then, then people lose 50% plus on their money and then they get out and then NVIDIA goes on the next big run and it reaches 2000, 3000 and people are like, oh, I want to get out. You know, it's just, you got to understand what's really going on here if you're going to even play into any of these sorts of investments, right? Impact on others, with Salesforce, utilities, are there other places where the beginning of AI hesitancy is playing out? Um, I think there are, but I think you know what's more important in, in looking at hesitancy, and you know, especially some of the points you're making about whether to invest, whether not to invest. You know, considering the fundamental backdrop, because a lot of what has been driving some of these moves and these names that you've been mentioning have been earnings related, earnings reporting related. And what was really clear this earnings season is that it, it really is no longer the case that if you just beat on earnings things are going to go well for you from a stock perspective. You really have to have the sales component, but also now the outlook component. Even if you just look at the 10 worst performers in the S&P for their actual earnings days when they were reporting, um, half of those, they beat earnings. But where a lot of the stress was concentrated was when they didn't have good sales results and when they didn't have strong outlooks. I think that becomes a bigger part of the story, especially because this is now happening. This momentum reversal a bit is happening in a more richly valued market. You know, when you look at something even like the tech sector, Back in the beginning of 2023, the forward PE in that sector was 20. Now we're all the way up to 27. We hit the other day, earlier this week, the highest for that forward PE since 2002. So I think it brings in more hesitancy, especially from a fundamental aspect. And then we got those you know, pretty benign inflation numbers out today. They did not really give a lift to tech, but they did to, to other rate-sensitive areas of the market, like... Um, AT&T and Bank of America and the utility. Listen, you know, they got to start putting respect on a company's name, okay? You're sick of them talking about AI stocks and not talking about this one stock. Do you know what stock it is? Palantir. Put some respect on that company's name, man. It, it seems like every day I wake up and see another big deal announced by Palantir. Another big deal. Another big deal. Oof. Growth rates are going up substantially, right? And um, everything that business is just getting better and better and better. They better start respecting Palantir. I don't think they understand what's really going on there. But, um, you know, there's a very high probability by this time next year. They'll, they'll get it. They'll get it. Let's listen to NVIDIA CEO talking here very recently. Computer graphics is one that you can operate completely in parallel. Computer graphics, image processing, physics simulations combinatorial optimizations, graph processing, database processing, and of course, the very famous linear algebra of deep learning. There are many types of algorithms that are very conducive to acceleration through parallel processing. So we invented an architecture to do that by adding the GPU to the CPU, the specialized processor can take something that takes a great deal of time and accelerate it down to something that is incredibly fast. And because the two processors can work side by side, they're both autonomous and they're both separate, independent that is, we can accelerate what used to take 100 units of time down to one unit of time. Well, the speed up is incredible. It almost sounds unbelievable. It almost sounds unbelievable. 
But today I'll demonstrate many examples for you. The benefit is quite extraordinary. A hundred times speed up, but you only increase the power by about a factor of three. And you increase the cost by only about 50%. We do this all the time in the PC industry. We add a GPU, a $500 GPU, GeForce GPU, to a $1,000 PC, and the performance increases tremendously. We do this in a data center. A billion dollar data center, we add $500 million worth of GPUs, and all of a sudden, it becomes an AI factory. This is happening all... Uh, you know, I don't understand why this concept is, is even hard for people to understand, right? In terms of using multiple chips that are separate, combining them together, and getting uh, much better results and everything moving faster. We do this as humans all the time. Let me give you an example, okay? Let's say I say, hey, I need you to, to you know, build a street out here, okay? And, you know, I say, you know, you don't have any tools to work with. Just do it with your hands and just build that street out there, right? I mean, could you imagine how long that would take to, like, build a proper street with no tools? Like, it might be almost impossible, right? But let's say all of a sudden I give you a shovel now to work with, right? Yeah, okay, maybe that speeds up the process a little bit, right? Now, let's say I also give you a bunch of material that's already at the job site. Now, let's say also I say, here's five other people that are going to help you build this street. And, you know, now we got steamrollers and we got all this different machinery to help you. I mean, all of a sudden, that process could go from, you know, at first, it might take you a year to build the street, right? Um, to now it takes you a week to build the street or a day to build the street, right? Completely, like we're talking about, you know, 100xing, way more than 100xing, how fast you could actually do this. But just adding some tools there, just adding some more humans to help you, right? So, I mean, these, these sorts of concepts, it, this happens in the real world all the time, right? Unless, unless it's a state-built street, then it's still going to probably take more time than ever, right? Over the world today. Well... The savings are quite extraordinary. You're getting 60 times performance per dollar. 100 times speed up, you only increase your power by 3x. 100 times speed up, you only increase your cost by 1.5x. The savings are incredible. The savings are measured in dollars. It is very clear that Many, many companies spend hundreds of millions of dollars processing data in the cloud. If it was accelerated, it is not unexpected that you could save hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, why is that? Well, the reason for that is very clear. We've been experiencing inflation for so long in general purpose computing. Now that we finally came to, we finally determined to accelerate there's an enormous amount of captured loss that we can now regain. A great deal of captured, retained waste that we can now relieve out of the system and that will translate into savings. Savings of money, savings in energy. And that's the reason why you've heard me say, the more you buy, the more you save. <laughs> well done, Jensen, <laughs> well done. I like that sales presentation there. <laughs> the more you buy, the more you save. Brilliant. Alrighty, let's get into Salesforce and a few other stocks and talk about if these stocks are dead money. Reaction wow, uh, to this oh, terrible four? day for the stock following the first revenue miss since February all the way back to 2006. I think it's a little bit of an overreaction on the downside, honestly, in, in terms of the stock reaction, but it's also a, a good example of just how high expectations have become uh, for some of the names within large cap tech. But I do think when you think about Salesforce, the profit margin improvement was phenomenal <laughs> during the quarter year over year. Um, and that's what everybody had been focused on. Of course, the top line matters a lot too, but I think we're in this weird moment in time when a lot of companies are taking a pause and trying to digest. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of questions about how to best implement and utilize AI. And so- This Salesforce move is just another reason why you shouldn't get involved in trying to worry about these stocks and play these stocks from a short-term trading perspective. Because it's just a complete joke. The way, you know, they manipulate these stocks around is, is utterly ridiculous. For instance, look at Salesforce, right? You know, that stock falls 20 plus percent. Did it really deserve to fall 20 plus percent? No. And then all of a sudden, magically, it just skyrockets the next day, seven and a half percent, right? 
is that right either? No, right? This is more like, oh, the put holders are making way too much money, right? We need to kill that so a lot of those profits off. And then they bounce the stock all the way back to 234. You know, it's all suspicious. It's all a bunch of crap, right? That's why you don't even mess with these. It's like you love Salesforce stock and they want to, you know, do that sort of move down. Cool. Go ahead. Take advantage. Buy buy shares and build your position out, right? But don't try to play these things from the short-term perspective because I'm just telling you the angles they got, it's ridiculous in terms of how they manipulate these stock prices around on a short-term basis. Over time, Salesforce will be valued based upon the company's net income, right? Short-term... Uh, it is valued on whatever opinions, whatever manipulation they're doing in the, the trading algorithms, right? That's causing um, a lot of companies to, to delay decision making. Uh, but I think when it comes to Salesforce and AI, a lot, the, the goal of AI for many companies is to better utilize their data. And a lot of companies' proprietary data that they use all the time is stored within Salesforce. And it has to do with their sales true. pipeline and their customers. True. So I do think that Salesforce is going to remain um, a viable company throughout all of this and be of great value to many companies. So for that true. reason, we are sticking with our position here. Even though the stock is down, we've owned it for a long time. Mm-hmm. We've owned it since 2016, uh, but nice. we're sticking with it. That's a long time. Would you consider adding more down 21%? At this point, I think we wanted, there is uncertainty, no doubt, in right. the marketplace. Um, so we're not adding more at this point in time. Uh, but in, you know, if it were to go down further, which I hope it doesn't, mm-hmm. but it might over the next <coughs> couple days, but if it were to go down further, it might represent more of a buying opportunity. You don't, you don't know. So let's say, uh, let, let's see where Salesforce was in 2016. My guess is the stock price was a heck of a lot lower than where it is today, right? So... Let's see where this baby was at back then. 2016, so $80 a share, roughly. Yeah, looks like mostly in the 80s, could be in the 60s. So when they were buying in, we can call it somewhere between you know 60 and $100. Let's assume they were buying a little after as well, right? Um, yeah, I mean, the stock's 200 plus, you know, it's like you already probably have a good position built out. It's gone up a lot over you know the, the years. And so I could understand not necessarily needing to go grab more shares. Josh, but you certainly watch it. Um, yeah. I know your company uses it. You've said it a, a number of times, I think. But still, um, what, what do we do with this? Well, correct me if I'm wrong. Despite the fact that they missed and the guidance wasn't great, it was still an 11% growth year over year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so this is a gigantic company still finding ways to grow. But I think Brenda absolutely nails it. We're in a weird time where the <laughs> expectations have been ratcheted up. Okay. And not every company on a 90-day basis is going to hit those expectations. I'm looking at the software sector in general. General, Scott, because when you have a bellwether name in the group down 21%, my guess is there are going to be opportunities created, maybe not day one to burn this point. It could get worse, of course. But think about what's happening across the entire spectrum. Number one, the cyber names are getting hit hard on the back of this. When you hear Benny off talk about sales cycles being elongated, the fear is that this extends not just Uh, to the four walls within Salesforce, but to every software conversation at the enterprise level. That's probably true. I don't think it's as true for the cyber names. So CrowdStrike down 6% today. Palo Alto down another three. Okta down six. There is probably opportunity. Then you look at some of the bigger SaaS names in general. These stocks have been absolutely hammered. Intuit is off 18%. ServiceNow off 19%. Mm -hmm. Uh, Workday down 33. Adobe down 34 These companies, they're not all perfect comps, but what they all have in common is they are in massive bear market drawdowns from... Uh, Let me pull up 1000X here. I want to see valuations on some of these stocks. All right, here we go. I want to hear... uh, He just rattled off a lot of stocks, right? Let's hear some of these. It's as true for the cyber names. So CrowdStrike down 6% today. Palo Alto down another three. Okta down six. There is probably opportunity. Then you look at some of the bigger SaaS names in general. These stocks have been absolutely hammered. Intuit is off 18%. ServiceNow off 19%. Mm -hmm. Uh, Workday down 33. Adobe down 34. These companies, they're not all perfect comps, but what they all have in common is they are in massive bear market drawdowns from their own highs. I don't think most people even understand how much damage is is happening. The media... Yeah, so... Yeah, looking at these stocks, so you look at something like a CrowdStrike, right? Really rich valuation on that one, 84 forward PE, but the growth rates are pretty sweet in this one, right? 
I mean, that's that's very nice growth rates there. But there's no doubt, I mean, still an 84 forward piece and 84 forward P. Looking into it, uh, obviously very well established, more mature company, 34 forward P. So much richer than the market in general, right? Um, and still expected to have double digit revenue growth here. So that's pretty sweet. Um, and expected that earnings per share is expected to go up even more. And then if we look at Workday, 32 forward P on this one. I don't want to comment too much on Workday's business model because I haven't gone in depth enough on Workday yet. But in terms of the forward P versus these growth rates, it's actually relatively attractive. But I would have to understand more about Workday's specific business model there. That's one I haven't done enough work on. So, um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, when you have multiples, when I say multiples, I'm talking really trailing 12-month P's and forward P's that trade significantly above where the market's trading at. You know, people get scared. These stocks get hit really, really hard. That's why when you see crashes, many times you see the growth stocks get hit much harder. Like if you see S&P 500 move down 25% or they'll say the NASDAQ move down 25%, you see many of these higher growth names, higher multiple names get hit way more than 25%. They can get hit 40, 50, 60%. RSI in the 25 software companies in the S&P 500 relatively, is 37. CRM is the most washed out at 16. So I'm oh, more likely oh, to be looking for an opportunity to buy than sell, given the price action that we've already seen here. I mean, there were a lot of stocks within the software space that got this AI halo. Um, and now it's time to pay the piper. If you look at, Josh named some stocks in this space that are, are down a bunch. I mean, year to date, Zscaler's down 28%, Snowflake's down 27%, <coughs> Shopify's down 25%. Okay, uh, let's go ahead, let's pull up Zscaler, right? Was that ticker symbol just Z? Uh, Zscaler, ZS, okay. And then he was talking about Snowflake. Let's see, I already know Snowflake has a rich valuation on it. I'm just not sure how much. And then he was talking about Shopify, which is a stock I love. So we look at Shopify here. Let's compare these guys. So Zscaler, no trailing 12-month P, which means they weren't even profitable in the past uh, 12 months. Ford P62 on this baby, based upon estimates there. Snowflake, I mean, look at that forward PE and no, no, no trailing 12-month P. And then Shopify, you know, looks like uh, the best deal of the bunch if we're just looking at forward P. But, you know, this is these are the sorts of stocks that get hammered when people get freaked out, man. It really does. They really do. We saw Shopify stock goes down, what was it, 80% peak to trough in the 2022 crash? Did we not? You know, from where Shopify peaked in 2022 to where it hit bottom in 20, or excuse me, where it peaked in 2021 versus where it it bottomed in 22. It was, I think it was like an 80% fall, right? Was it not? So let's see here. You know, peaking out, you know, 170 ish. And then at the lows down to 20. <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't know if my math is the best, but I think that's about an 80% fall. Is it not peak to trough? It's vicious. It's vicious. I mean, Shopify's still in recovery mode from that big crash, right? It will eventually way over top this long term. But um, it's still actually in recovery mode. It's 59. It used to be 170. So despite the business fundamentals getting better and better and better. So that's just, it's just, you got to understand that with these stocks, right? This, a lot of people, they, you know, everybody wants to own growth stocks. Everybody wants to own the exciting companies that got the big growth rates. Well, they also come with bigger valuations. And you better, you better be able to take those downturns because you're going to have downturns in these stocks every, you know, three years, five years, seven years. And when they go through those downturns, it's vicious. It's vicious. I mean, you can see 30 to, you know, 80% falls in a quick amount of time. And you've got to be willing to hold through that. And then if these companies really got brilliant futures in front of them, you've got to be willing to, to buy when those stocks are getting absolutely obliterated. So you can come out to the other side and look um, at much brighter days, right? Days down 25. Twilio 24, Adobe 24, Cloudflare 15, ServiceNow 6.5. But they look a lot different than the chip names, don't they? And they look a lot different than the mega cap names, don't they? It leads me to Bill Baruch. He's our committee member who's selling Salesforce today. He joins us now to tell us exactly why you've lost confidence and now you're bailing. Tell us more. Well, first and foremost, I'm looking at this from a portfolio management standpoint. It's in our bottom five. You know, say, say we own it about a 1% allocation to it. And yeah, I mean, since we bought it, it's about a 30 basis point hit. 
But I look at this as potentially being dead money over the next couple of weeks, couple of months. When a, when a stock gets slammed this heavily, it's just going to chop around. I think there's a Jeez, back- what a joke. <laughs> what a joke. Oh, my gosh. I was, I was waiting for this guy to talk about his dead money for the next year or the next few years. And the man comes out and says, yeah, I think it's dead money for the next uh, you know, week or month. Now, now I hope Salesforce just blasts higher. I'm glad it made that 7.5% move Friday. I hope it goes to like 250 in the next like four weeks. I hope it happens just because it's such a ridiculous statement he's just made there. Holy smokes, guys. You can't be making your investment decisions based upon what you think is going to happen with the stock price in the next few weeks or the next month. That's just – that was ridiculous. 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 And yeah, I mean, since we've bought it, it's about a 30 basis point hit. But I look at this as potentially being dead money over the next couple of weeks, couple of months. When a, when a stock gets slammed this heavily, it's just going to chop around. Uh-huh. I think there's a better place to put that capital and, and, and it can allocate it somewhere else. Now, I think there's some AI indirection. We're seeing that being highlighted here today. It's not just in Salesforce. and It's, it's across some of this, the, the software industry in general. Um, I mean, look at the revenue miss. Josh highlighted the the 11% year over year growth, but what's the trajectory here? And there's they're blaming macroeconomic issues. There, are, I think, some leadership. There needs to be some shakeups there. So I, I've lost confidence in this company right now. And again, I think from a portfolio standpoint, being in my bottom five, I'd rather cut it loose, move on from it, and, and allocate the capital somewhere else. Yeah. All right. Good stuff. I'll let you go. You can't do that. You can't do what this man just did. No. Okay. You can't go talking about, yeah, we're selling it. You know, we think it might be dead money for the next, uh, you know, a few weeks, a couple months, blah, blah, blah. And then after that, right, then try to make a fundamental case about this or that. That was just utterly ridiculous, okay? Like, don't, don't try to come over to our side of, like, thinking like an investor thinks about fundamentals when you're out there selling a stock because you think it's dead money for the next few weeks or, few, or a couple months. Like, that is ridiculous, okay? Stay on your side. You can't play both sides. A lot of people think they can play both sides. No, you're either over there with the trader bunch making your trading decisions, trying to get in and out of these stocks and trying to make a breadcrumb here or there, or you're over with us and the investors thinking about these stocks for the next several years. This is a buying the dip opportunity because we think this company can grow into a $400 stock, and here's why, we because we think the net income is going to go to blah, blah, blah price and the valuation should be there. Like It's a whole different ballgame, folks, okay? So, you know, if you are somebody out there that you want to actually join a group of law Long-term investors, you can apply, pin comment down there for my private group. We think long-term in regards to these stocks. We're thinking about these stocks over the coming years. I, all my course curriculums are focused on teaching you everything you need to know over the coming years and not getting caught up into this game of in and out and in and out. And Oh my gosh, guys, that's a whole game. So pin comment down there, click on that, fill out an application, and uh, hopefully we can get you in there in the next couple of weeks into my private group. Okay, Much love and have a great day.